are listening to Aim Higher, a Catholic podcast designed to instruct and to encourage the daily practice of our faith. I am ready. Pax et bonum, peace and good to you all. Welcome to the final part of our, and I, I was trying to think, what are we going to call the series? In Mexico, Viva Cristo Rey. Um, we'll have to think about it. But this is part three of that series. And in this part, Father Anthony, as he alluded at the end of part two, that he's going to read the sermons from um, Bishop Madrigal and Bishop Giles. So kick it away, Father. Well, thank you very much, sister. Uh, what we did, uh, the... Yeah, sermon, the, ser- the sermon was given the normal place with a sermon after the gospel. Which it, I will add, those sermons are on YouTube as well. And I'll share those links. Oh, the sermons are on YouTube. Yeah, it's the thing is, they're not listed. You have to have the link. So that's why I'll, um, mm. I'll, um, I'll, I'll send. Well, this then, to this is a very, this is a very easy episode for us. Just go oh, to so the you, link. Go oh, to the okay. link. <laughs> See, when you talked about doing this, I thought you already knew about that. So, nope, I didn't know, but that's fine. I want to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. I want to have it on a another higher. place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, well, for those who have not read it, seen it, uh, we, uh, Bishop Mother Gall, had both himself and Bishop Giles write out sermons. And Father Martin gave the Spanish translation of the sermon of Bishop Ma- of Giles, and I read an English translation of Bishop Mother Giles. And it went well. Mm-hmm. It went really well. And that to say, with those acoustics, it's very easy. You don't have to, you don't, you don't have to uh, do too much projection. Did you actually have to kind of tone yourself down a little bit? I I might have done it subconsciously, but I didn't I didn't make any special effort. Gotcha. That, that I recall. Close so close to me. So, okay. <clears throat> I will read the one written by Bishop Giles first. My dear brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, we are deeply moved and honored to be invited to share this memorable occasion with you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We address you as brothers and sisters because we indeed are more closely related than the world will ever understand. One, we are children of God. We have the same creator. Two, we are all redeemed by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And three, we share the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. Our nationalities and politics may differ, but our spiritual nationality is one and the same, with Jesus Christ as our King, Lord, and Master. We generally have little to no control over our nationality. It is predominantly the decision of where God has chosen us to be born. However, Our spiritual nationality is a matter of our choice. We can choose Jesus Christ as our king or Caesar. That is, the world as our king. We have all chosen to enter and remain in the one true Catholic Church with our Lord Jesus Christ. We are one nation under the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. We may speak different languages. We may be different in many ways, but we are one in the unity of faith with Jesus as our King. Today we honor Jesus, our King, but remind ourselves that we are his militia. We are the church militant, working and fighting for our King. We are working for our personal salvation because this is the will of our King, that we share an eternal kingdom in heaven with him. We work for the salvation of our fellow man, 
even our enemies, because Jesus Christ also desires their salvation. We must fight against our own concupiscence, the scandals of the world, and the demonic fallen angels. We are called, is we are invited, to enter the kingdom of Jesus Christ as his disciples. To answer this call, we must deny ourselves in many ways, especially by fasting and penance and following the laws of God and the Church. We must virtuously embrace and carry the crosses that God gives us. When we fall or fail under this cross, we must rise and continue with every ounce of strength that we have in us. We must persevere even as the, as the sacrifice of our wealth, honor, position, health, and even our very lives. Soon we will be celebrating the Feast of All Saints. We honor all saints, especially the holy martyrs, who gave their lives and blood for the true faith and true King. It is said that the truest form of praise is imitation. May we imitate the holy martyrs, at least in desire, even if we cannot imitate them in deed. Our fathers in the faith have shed their very blood for our King and the faith. We should strive to be worthy children and follow their best examples. If we are if we are never called to spill our blood for Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church, we must nevertheless be ready, willing, and able to do so. God is good and accepts the true desires as if they were the deed. We know this is how our King will judge us because he has directly told us in the Sermon on the Mount, the man who harbors hatred in his heart is already guilty of murder. Matthew 5, 21, 22. The man who lusts after another is already guilty of adultery. Matthew 5, 28. While we must strive to avoid these harmful desires, we should likewise seek to fill our hearts with good and holy desires. Even if our desires are never reached, the king will pass judgment upon us for the intention of our hearts. Evil desires will be punished, and good desires will be war rewarded. While we have spoken of Jesus Christ as our spiritual king, or as the king of a religious nation in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we must also remind ourselves that he is the king of our physical bodies and the physical world as well. The interior movement of our hearts and wills are of the utmost importance, but this is in no way but this in no way negates our physical and material duties and obligations. There are many evils in this world that our king seeks to put an end to. He has put us here, has appointed us to go forth and fight the good fight. We can do very little individually, but we must do what we can. For the love of our king and our neighbor, we must perform both spiritual and corporal works of mercy. Among these many works, we must pay special attention to the admonishing of sinners. Ourselves? and those around us. Good and loyal citizens of the kingdom of Jesus Christ must always give a good example to lead others into the kingdom. We must also constantly strive to avoid e ever giving scandal. Scandal leads souls out of the kingdom of Jesus Christ and into the kingdom of hell. A good intention is not merely wishful thinking. Good intentions are ready to be implemented immediately at some future date. Too often our prayers are nothing more than wishful thinking and are weak and ineffectual. Nothing 
ever comes of such prayers. We are made of both body and soul. We must turn inward and pray and desire so that we must ha- so that we have the will and determination to manifest them in the material or physical world around us. We must not fear demonic or worldly power because we belong to the old good and powerful king, Jesus Christ. It often appears that we lose battles in our in our lives. While individual battles are important, we must strive to do our best in all of them. The final battle, the culmination of the war, is our goal. We know the war's outcome. Jesus Christ the King will reign eternally supreme. The only question is, will we be with him in his kingdom when all is said and done? Will he welcome us as good and faithful soldiers and servants? Or will he reject us as traitorous mercenaries or lazy and faithless servants? On this glorious feast of Jesus Christ the King, may we muster up ever greater resolve to live up to the faith of our calling as militants in the true church, the true kingdom. We must pray and worship our king, but we must not forget to serve him. We each must do our part, politically, socially, materially, and above all, spiritually. Work and prayer must go hand in hand. May this church and its dedication to Jesus Christ the King ever be a constant reminder to live up to our calling in his kingdom. We are his soldiers to fight the evil days of our, the evils of our day. We are his servants to minister to him and his church. Above all, we are his children to love him as he loved us. His kingdom is not of this world, but it is in this world. Though we are in this world, we are not made for this world but we are made for heaven. May our Lord and King Jesus Christ, in union with God, the Father Almighty, and the Holy Ghost, bless you and keep you until you are eternally united with him in heaven. And that ends the sermon given by Bishop Giles on October the 29th, 2023, on the Feast of Christ the King. <clears throat> so, sister, your impressions? Well, I mean, I I read it the first time um, a few weeks ago before he sent it to Bishop Madrigal, so pretty well familiar with it, but I, I, I think it's a really great message. Um, and I will add that people will be able to read it themselves in the upcoming issue of The Seraph, so um, you'll have that to um, refer to as well. So, but. What I appreciate is how His Excellency took the time to remind us about our spiritual goals and what we have to do to obtain them. Yes, the unity we have in one faith, but how we have to live that faith and how we are meant to not just be under Christ the King, but to serve Christ our King. And that this is a battle that we have to wage against not just flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. It is a spiritual battle. And It's days like the dedication. It's days like the high, any high feast in the church. Whether you're talking about what well, we had All Saints Day, well, any of the holy days. We have Christmas. We have Easter. We have Pentecost. Any of these days uh, really should be a an inspiration for us. Uh, we really should look forward to these with a spiritual mind. And we want to do our best to offer ourselves 
to God. Because remember, we the church signifies, symbolizes, I should say, also the soul of the individual. And is a soul that must be blessed and sanctified before Almighty God. And it's such an encouraging message, taking us back to Christ's kingship and how our intentions. And I think that's very important. I'm so glad His Excellency brought that up because very often in our lives, we want to do something, but we're unable to do it. Something legitimately gets in our way. Let's we'll use a very simple example. Let's say you intended to go to Mass and receive communion on this day. Let's say it was the feast of your patron saint. You had every desire, and you realizing the graces that you receive, having that intention, offering it in the honor of your saint, and of course, in, in honor of our Lord Jesus Christ the glory of God the Father and the Holy Ghost. and But something gets in your way and you're not able to do it. You say, well, that was a waste. I, I What was my, then, then, then I didn't get anything from it. But if you intended to do it and it was beyond your control, it was not because of laziness or weakness, but legitimate. God is going to recognize that. And as our as Bishop brought up, if he is going to treat our thoughts, whether it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thought against the sixth, ninth commandment as though already committing the act of adultery or um, the act of murder, if we have that kind of hatred, that God's going to be just and fair. And then our intentions he's going to take in the place that is so important, especially in this day that we live in. Right. Remembering that he does accept the desire, you know, and that goes on both sides. If you, you're desiring to do evil, you know, he's going to take you at your word. Mm-hmm. Just, just, on, but on the other side of that, the good. As St. Saint, St. Joseph of Corpertino said, let your intentions be the right ones and don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So. That, I mean, I need to write that one down. Um, Cause I want to say I worry, but I just, I overthink. At least I think I overthink. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I overthink. You're overthinking. I think <laughs> I am. I'm not sure. So. <clears throat> what do you think? I think so. Oh, no, I don't think you're overthinking on this. Not at this particular uh, moment. this particular boy, moment. Boy. Um, well, this next, the next one will be pretty smooth for me to read since I read it in public already. I was, uh, boy, I'm trying to remember if I knew w- or when Bishop Madrigal told me this is what I was going to be doing. Um, it's not something you say no to. Oh, of course not. Uh, I'm not going to put myself in a St. Anthony of Padua situation. Uh, <laughs> uh, everyone refusing to give a sermon. And then you go to Anthony, St. Anthony, says, go preach. Um, No, no, please, excuse me. No, you're going to do it. Okay. And then, well, eloquence comes out. Beautiful spiritual eloquence. But I'm not not, um, comparing myself to St. Anthony (laughs) in this story. I compare myself to the other friars here. Or the other priests who didn't want to preach said, "No, I'm going to do it, and I don't got to preach. I just have to read." Well, and also that, but also just that—that that yes, that know. yes, that you yes. know. <laughs> so when I say, "Well, what? What's? Why would you even second guess it?" Well, we saying yes is not always easy. I mean, this should really have not have been a problem for you. I mean, and you're not alluding that it was, but I mean, all you were was just reading, no. and even if, no. and even if you just had at that very moment been asked, "Father, why don't you give a sermon?" No doubt in my mind, the Holy Ghost would have provided for you if you had asked yeah. them. So, and and why? How could I was I like, Father, how do you come with a sermon? And I've been asked that there are times that I didn't have time to prepare for something, and you just preach. But I remember what Bishop Lewis taught. 
when in doubt, preach your meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Ghost will help you. And as St. Bernard of Clairvaux uh, made very clear, whenever the the thought of pride would enter the mind, says, Satan, I did not begin this for you, and I will not end this for you. That's good. I like that. Hmm. Okay. The second sermon from the feast the de- of Christ the King, dedication of Christ the King, dedication of the church itself. For Bishop Louis Madrigal. <clears throat> long, um, long live Christ the King in my heart, in my house, and in my country. Your most reverend excellen- excellency, Bishop Giles Butler, I greatly appreciate your presence, and I'm grateful that you were the first to confirm your visit. Here, we highly esteem and pay reverence to one of the successors of the apostles. Thanks for coming. Likewise, we appreciate the presence of Father Anthony, also of the Franciscan Friars Minor, and the regular clergy of His Excellency along with the faithful who visit us from the United States, and among them my dear brother and his wife. I also wish to mention and thank Father Walter Huber, a member of my clergy, and Mother Gertrude, as well as the faithful who have come from Europe to attend the ceremony. We greet the faithful who have come from Chile, and I must welcome and publicly thank my fellow apostolate, Father Francisco Martin Bajaras, I affectionately greet all my faithful present here, friends and acquaintances. May God shower you abundantly with spiritual and physical benefits, and thank you for your assistance. This is the month of Christ the King. October is adorned with many saints starting with Our Lady in the Motherhood of the Blessed Virgin, Our Lady of the Rosary, Apostles like St. Simon and St. Jude, Evangelists like St. Luke, of the Guardian Angels and St. Raphael, two Francises, that of Borgia, and our patron saint, St. Francis of Assisi, of two Teresas, that of Avila and that of Lexiu, of the two widows, uh, Brigida and Eduviges, and of the founder, like St. Bruno, of a virgin, like St. Margaret Mary of Alacoque, of kings, like St. Edward, and the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, Christ the King, on the last Sunday of October in which we meet. In 1925, Pope Pius XI instituted this feast. This has been our program, and we desire that our Lord Jesus Christ truly reigns among us. That is why yesterday we began the solemn ceremony that continues today. And how did this happen? Keeping a vigil on our knees, with our heads lowered, our eyes closed, and in front of the relics of the martyrs, the night encompasses a soft silence that is only interrupted by the change of shift of the different guards that follow each other every hour. The flames of the candles that illuminate the the premises and are consumed in honor of the relics of the martyrs that will be placed in the tomb of the main altar do not cease to revive our hope. The flowers penetrate our sense of smell with their fragrance and make us sigh for the peace of Christ during the evening. This is how we have spent the night in preparation for what will happen during the day. Already, very early in the morning, the chants of the vigil have made the Gregorian notes resonate, making themselves feel felt with their plain sound. The sonorous melodies have alternated between the dignities of the clergy and the faithful. Those songs rose to heaven, imploring the assistance of the martyrs 
before the heavenly throne. At the end of singing the divine office, at the end of singing the divine office, the sun is already rising and it's time to gather all the faithful outside the church. Inside, there is only one deacon. With the church empty and the faithful crowded outside, all the all the perimeter walls of the monumental building have been blessed with holy water. Then in front of the main door, the pontiff ordered, Open the doors that the king of glory will enter, and all the evil spirits flee with the sign of the cross. Upon entering, we walk through the main doors. While outside, the clarity of the day invades everything. The fresh wind blows very calmly, inviting us to continue with such a suggestive ceremony. While we all kneel, we feel the heavenly presence and all the saints invoked in the litany of the saints. Kyrie Rehison, Lord have mercy on us. And then we invoke the mother of God and her most chaste husband, the angels, the apostles, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, doctors, founders, virgins. We have welcomed all of them to free us from all evil, from sin, from eternal death, from desolation, from plague, from hunger, and the scourge of earthquakes. The sweet dew of the holy Gregorian water has succeeded in resounding invocations of the inhabitants of heaven. In this way, we arrive at the ceremony of, possess, of possessing of the church in the form of a cross of St. Andrew before the saint died in this way, because the saint died in this way. Ashes and sand have been scattered on the floor, and there with the staff the pontiff wrote the Greek and Latin alphabets. All the faithful continue to wait for these suggestive ceremonies. The sun continues to rise in the celestial vault. The peaceful song of the birds can be heard, and inside, the ceremony directed to the place, the relics of the martyrs in the tomb of the altar. He had already been invoked with the singing of the litanies. His patronage has already been requested. And now the pontiff and the faithful people, as witnesses have, with utmost reverence, deposited his remains in the tomb and then sealed it. This ceremony has given rise to the third part of the ceremony. To entirely consecrate this tremendous place that it, it that is the house of God and the door to heaven. This happens at the moment of the anointing with the chrism, and with the words pronounced by the bishop, May this temple be erected and consecrated in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost for the honor of God. There are twelve crosses distributed on the columns. He has anointed them and also the door. In the same way he has anointed the altar, saying, Let this altar be signed and sanctified in the honor of God. We have just witnessed the anointings, the incense burned, the relics, and all the gestures. These remain in our memory as reminders of the great actions that we have just witnessed. We have already at attended the ceremony of the consecration of the church, but first it was necessary to carry out the construction, and this has been epic. It was on the festival of Christ the King in 2002 when we started. Many years, and no time, at no time, have we doubted that this could be achieved. By laying one brick and then another, one day we would finish if God allows it. Hard and long days, but always moving forward. There were always few resources, and not because there was no cooperation, but because the construction is enormous. We redoubled our efforts in a thousand ways to ensure that the spirit did not decline and thus kept the flame lit, and yet the enthusiasm of some waned. It is very great. There are many years left. We are not going to see it finished, and things like that. 
At this point, I would like to remember that if the Lord does not build the house, the workers build in vain. And so it is. It is our Lord Jesus Christ who has seen fit to grant us such grace after testing our disposition. But what is a church? A church is a sacred building dedicated to the worship so that all the faithful can publicly exercise divine worship there, as defined in Canon 1161. The consent of the bishop is required before a church can be built. Canon 1162.1 and Canon 1166 prescribes that the day of consecration should be on a Sunday or a day of obligation. On this day of consecration, a year of indulgence is granted that can be gained by anyone who visits the church or altar on the same day of consecration. So to build a church, we must have the approval of the ecclesiastical authority. Once built, it is required. It requires an act of power on the part of the prelate to consecrate it and allow the faithful to exercise divine worship publicly. So both building and consecrating a church is something very typical of the Catholic Church. This church is yours. In it, we receive the sacraments from baptism to extra unction. We must take care of it, finish it, beautify it, and love it. That is why we must live here, God. That's, I'm sorry. That is why we will live here, God willing. And why does all this happen? Because this is a great place. It is the house of God and the door to heaven. Here we publicly profess our faith, and this is the terrible moment of our combat. We wish to remain and die Catholics, for which it is necessary to maintain the apostolic succession, and with the episcopacy, faithful priests, and the true doctrine and the true sacraments free, from, free of every doubt. Here in this chapel, Deo gratias, we have it. Furthermore, at this time, it is essential to support the only honest response, as Monsignor Vizelis said, to the painful reality, the vacancy of Rome. There are two sine qua non conditions to remain if we wish to remain authentic Catholics. That is why, to express our adhesion to the Church militant, I invite everyone to stand up and sing loudly that glorious song of our Mexican faithful, who, shouting Viva Cristo Rey, shed their blood for what we, all, what we also want to defend, the Holy Mother Catholic Church and the reign of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that ends Bishop Mother Gell's sermon. And he invited everyone to sing that Mexican hymn. Obviously, I did not join because I did not know it, but it was beautiful. And there, it's he gives quite a lot of food for thought in his sermon. When I read this, Bishop Mondragal had me read it before to make any corrections that might have needed, you know, with, with a translation. I uh, I was moved right away. He took the time to to honor you know, Bishop Bishop Giles and all of us, but in just reminding us that within the month of October, there's so many feasts and so many people from different walks of life, sit for vocations, are honored among the saints. And it reminds us how the liturgical year and the calendar is made up and uh, how, how we are, uh, how we become a really uh, united in this just what a uh, so much that could be said uh, about it and i i really appreciated it 
um, just just to be a part of the whole just to be a part of the whole ceremony and and everything involved just reminding us of this unity we have with one another in the faith and I, I it it was an honor and a privilege to be a part of it mm-hmm. well i i really think I, this kind of ends uh this explanation it was beautiful sermons beautiful ceremony uh, beautiful people. And I would say for those um, who weren't able to co- to go, myself included, um, listening to your telling of the experience, reading the sermons, going online to Bishop Madrigal's website to see the pictures, to watch YouTube videos, it's, it all goes together that you really do get a pretty good experience from it too. Um, you will, you will spiritually benefit from it if you take the time to um, mm-hmm. uh, just take a glance, mm-hmm. listen to the, because what you, you, I find it interesting because when you read the sermons the way you did, they're not, it's not very long and I'm not trying to be like, Oh, but when you watch yeah. the video, yeah. Um, because there's the, the, uh, back and forth with English yeah. and Spanish, it's a little bit longer, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I probably feel like if I was in there at, at, in real time, I might've felt a little lost, but. Um, it was just a wonderful experience. And 